cool. So it was kind of a crazy discovery to find out that light was not just a wave. We always thought it was a wave classically, and now we found out it's not just a wave, it's a particle. And more properly, it has both wave-like and particle-like characteristics. It's not a wave, it's not a particle, but it's got characteristics of both. So matter, we always thought was particles, and light we always thought was waves. So somebody came along, Mr. De Broglie, in fact, and came along and said, you know what? If light is not just a wave, but also has particle-like characteristics, maybe matter also has wave-like characteristics. He was right. It's one of my favorite stories. He was a grad student getting his PhD and usually you write a thesis that's like 100 pages long or, or more. It's really a pain in the butt. His was like a page or two. Turns it in, his committee looks at it and they like send him out of the room. They're like, you guys know what he's talking about? No. You know what he's talking about? No. And so they just kind of dismiss him. They don't know what to tell him yet. They're like, we'll get back to you. And they send off his paper to Einstein and they ask him, what do you think? And Einstein gets back, he's like, he's a genius. Give him his PhD and send him to me. So, but I like it because he was smarter than his professors. <laughs> Good times. So it turns out that particles do have wave-like behavior. So, and here's the relation. So notice, the bigger the mass, what does that do to the wavelength? According to this relation right here. What's the relation between wavelength and mass? So actually, inversely related, if I double the mass, that actually cuts the wavelength in half. So can you see my wavelength right now? No, you can't. It's because I'm too fat. I have too much mass. So it turns out mass and velocity, so your wavelength's inversely proportional to both. And it only when you see like very small things like electrons can we actually measure their wavelength. But like you and I, never gonna happen. Our wavelengths are like, you know, even when I'm moving at a moderate pace, 10 to the like minus 40 something meters, you're never gonna see it. But for an electron, with a much, much, much smaller mass, we can totally measure the wavelengths. De Broglie was right. Cool. I don't know if you're gonna have to do a calculation with this. I doubt it. What you should know is the relations here. As wavelength, let's do it the other way around. As mass goes up, wavelength goes down. As velocity goes up, wavelength goes down. So your wavelength is inversely proportional to both mass and velocity. But, Natalie, what also, what funky constant's also showing up in this relationship? Constant. Planck's proportionality constant showing up yet again, rearing its ugly head. All right, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is a little bit funky thing. You need to know a couple things about this. Mathematically, we'd state it like this. I don't care that you know what the constant is. But this stands for the uncertainty in an object's position. Usually we're talking about electrons here. And this is the uncertainty in the object's momentum. Those are two very important words when talking about this. So this is position and momentum. So if it turns out if you take the, the uncertainty in one and the uncertainty in the other and you multiply them together, it always has to come out bigger or equal to a certain constant. So you, means you always have to have some certain amount of uncertainty. So let's say you minimize the uncertainty in the position. What's that gonna do to the uncertainty over here if it's still gotta come out bigger than this constant? It's gonna maximize it. And so it turns out the better you know the position, the less you'd know the momentum. The better you know the momentum, the less you know the position. And this is kind of weird. Momentum is related to like mass and velocity. So it's kind of dealing with like where an object's going. If we wanna limit to the velocity part. Whereas a position is kind of where an object is. And so it turns out, if we try and look at where an electron is in an atom, the more we know where it is, the less we know where it's going. The more I know where it's going, the less I know where it is. It's this weird conundrum. And it's totally true. Good times, right? So this guy was a genius. He was also head of Germany's H-bomb project. I'm glad he didn't succeed. And there are people who think he did it on purpose, not succeeding anyways. So... <laughs> Cool, shapes your orbitals. S, P's, and D's, what's an S orbital look like? Um, circle? Not a circle, it's three-dimensional. It's sphere. And again, is it a solid sphere or a hollow shell? Hollow shell. No, no, it's a solid sphere. The S orbital is not just this hollow basketball shell, it's like a bowling ball. From the nucleus all the way out to a certain distance, that's where we've got kind of a 95% probability of finding that electron. Cool, so P orbitals, those are those dumbbell shapes. And again, these are three-dimensional, which I can't really draw. So one lies on the y-axis, one lies on the x-axis, one lies on the z-axis, they different different orientation. 
And then your d orbitals. Most of your d orbitals look like a four leaf clover. And they differ based on their orientations and stuff as well. Well, again, it's going to look like a four leaf clover. So, or it could look like this funky shape as well. So if you notice, the, they're all in your hand out there. Four of the d orbitals look like this. They only differ in their orientations, what axis they're on and stuff like that. But the fifth one just looks funky. You should recognize S is spherical, P is dumbbell shaped, and D is one of these two shapes. Just recognize their shapes. Life is good.